Welcome to Spy Satellites, a podcast about Dune Imperium and the people who play it. I'm your host, CJ, and this is Rotation 4, where we determine which strategies in Dune Imperium, up through Immortality, are meta, and which are meme. So join us for a roundtable discussion focusing on cards, combos, atomics, and everything spice. If you like what we do, please give us a like and subscribe, and if you'd like to support us, you can do so on Patreon at patreon.com slash hiddenassets. Supporting us helps us continue to produce quality content and gives you access to some pretty awesome perks, including voting for the upcoming podcast topic. So tell your friends and let us know how we're doing. We're always trying to improve the quality of our content, and we can't do it without you, the listener. But today I'm not alone. Orbiting Arrakis with me is our helicopter Joe Looper and also someone whose vengeance for Mosaic Winds knows no bounds, Lannister. Hey. How is it going? That's going all right. Looking to get my revenge again, but uh, looks like the last one was me, right? So. Yeah, you won the last one. Yeah. <laughs> Just got uh, four or five more to go to even the score. Oh, God. I'm so far behind. <laughs> And also with me today, as our, also with us today, is our community noob stomper and fellow YouTube content creator, Cheezable. Hey, hi, CJ. Thanks for having me on the podcast. I'm glad to be here. And uh, for everyone who's listening, you can search for Cheezable on YouTube um, and find his awesome stuff. If you're watching um, on YouTube, you will find a link below to his content. Some of the uh, latest uh, Golden Path International games have been played by Cheezable or been cast by Cheezable and we were very grateful to have you do that sir thank you so much no problem always glad to contribute awesome okay well today we're talking about meta or meme and what that means is kind of up in the air I guess for me it's like a strategy that you know works that's meta something that's entered the meta something that people do over and over again and that works and something that's meme for me is something that kind of is a little bit hokey. It kind of works sometimes, you know, maybe it's just sort of a joke. Um, but I don't know, maybe you guys have uh, some thoughts on what those those uh, mean. One thing about Dune Imperium is that um, even though I think we're going to talk in broad strokes about strategy, it's a very reactive kind of board game. There's a lot of tactics involved. So uh, we'll talk about them in broad, in broad strokes, but um, a lot of it I still think is very tactical. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And just just so like everyone's knows, I, I've been using strategy generally. I do mean tactics and strategy kind of combined together. It's hard to separate those in Dune Imperium sometimes. Like you, it's really hard to go into the game with a set strategy. You kind of do have to pivot, right? It doesn't work that way. Yep. Yeah, I, I think the the first two turns you can kind of have an idea of what you want to do, but once the first player plays the action, it's like okay, everything goes out the window. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yep, and I I think that the what CJ said makes a lot of sense the fluidity is uh something that's required you you have a strategy in mind but once that strategy gets blocked you have to have a pivot so a secondary uh, source of whatever you're trying to achieve so um your strategy might be sound but it may become a meme later on because it's easily blocked or predictable so got to keep those in mind as well yeah Absolutely. All right, so we start it off. I'll, I'll go first, and then we'll go around the table. This is kind of how I envision it. We'll just talk about strategy. I'll, I'll introduce one, then you'll introduce one, and so on. And we'll just say whether you think it's a it's meme or whether you think it's actually meta. Um, first thing I want to say is that this is a strategy that started at the very beginning of Dune Imperium. It's called Hostaging the Great Flat. And I don't know, I just made that up. But basically, the idea is that you'd be the first one to still suits, and then other players would starve for for water for a turn or two um, and it always depends on your turn order and and how that sort of works but if you could hostage the great flat you could get like five sometimes even six water sorry so six spice out of the great flat and that's a pretty big uh big boost to your economy so i think it's a great strategy um i think it's one of the things that i think you realize early in the game that oh you you kind of want it to build up to a certain point and and you want to be the first one to harvest it I, I've I've been very greedy in some of my games. I think if you watch one of my uh B, one of my beast games I played, I I look at it and I'm like, okay, I think I can go up to a plus four bonus and, and I harvested like seven spice. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah. But I it's think always fun. 
one thing about this strategy is that once someone else has sword master right there are a lot of ways they can kind of weasel into like stealing it from you so um i think it's good but at a certain point of time in the game like i think when someone has sword master when it's round four if you don't harvest it it's very risky yeah i agree i think it's in this sense um it it is a sound strategy but it's slightly meme just because there's various ways around it so i'll give you an example um so you might be holding the the water necessary right now, but there are certain card combinations or uh, intrigues that just allow the people to just backdoor you, and that's a terrible way to go when you've saved up all that only for somebody to backdoor you. So for example, um, we have uh, Tessia who on the ring bonus can get the water all of a sudden. So you know, a weirding way can kind of just interrupt your flow when she goes up and gets her bonus and then get, gets it off the second action. Or the intrigue, um, um, forget what it's called. The uh, one spice for one water and a card. Uh, is that glimpse the path? Yeah, glimpse the path. Yeah, that's the one. And um, there are other functions as well that allow you to get the water all of a sudden, like killing a water peddler, for instance. So yep. a lot of these things just kind of interrupt the flow. I feel usually I'm not so greedy. I I just get five or six spice. The most I've seen is eight spice, but that was just really greedy. So. Yeah, it, it does. It does work. I think it worked better in the base game without Ix. Obviously, as soon as you add Ix, you add Water Peddler. There was always some like variable when like Johnny came out um, that could disrupt your plans, or a combat that gave Water for second place. That's a bit. That's a big deal. Like if you try to do this and there's a Water combat. You can't you can't it's just gonna blow up in your face and you'll end up with nothing <laughs> so like it yeah it can be definitely a trap i think i think one thing you need to do is like you need to have payoff for the spice so yes you're gonna get like one more spice by waiting another round uh, but what is that one extra spice gonna turn into right if if it delays your your tech tech purchase is it worth it to delay like to get one more spice in one more round or if is is, is it going to delay your highliner and i guess highliners are associated with interstellar shipping access so i think understand, understanding the payoff for the spice also is, is is good yeah absolutely i think that's really important if you don't have anything to do with that spice then why are you getting it right if there's a bunch of low tech uh low cost techs that kind of don't work with your strategy or you're just going to buy them just cuz I, I don't know does it it might probably help you in the long run but maybe it's uh yeah maybe too short-sighted i think with the right. spice spice pieces there's a break point of which they are good like with the great flat i think uh plus two is actually just like okay and and actually plus three is when it shines but yeah. plus, plus when you have plus two a bonus for the great flat you un um you don't you unset when you collect it so when you, when you harvest like five spice there you unset but when you have a plus three that you're very happy. I think with uh, Haga Basin, it'll be a plus two. And with Imperial Basin, actually, it's a plus one. Actually, that's my current weights on, on the, the various bases for Immortality. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense with the plus one. Just because of the water cost has to balance out, right? And the experimentation that you can play for it. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I'm actually a little bit lower on that. Um, I'm okay with just the plus two on the Great Flat. Mainly because the, the five spice I usually acquire uh, something like shuttle fleet at tech negotiation at minus one, or I go conspire. So this is more along the lines of um, a combat-based uh, strategy where you're trying to make up for lost ground with techs or getting the Solari for a conspire. So I'm a little less greedy on that. And honestly, as as an individual who regularly only uses two actions, I can't afford to have somebody backdoor me all of a sudden. So that opportunity loss would be huge for me. Well, the, the five spice still gets you a six cost tech if you tech negotiate, right? Yeah, so yeah. that's still good. Like basically if you get the extra spice, the sixth spice, and I've, I've always thought that this was strange about Dune Imperium. Um, in the base game, there were only, maybe there's just Leto's bring and maybe one other thing that let you spend one spice. Um, or I guess you could do, you could sell the spice for Solari at, you could sell three of it is an odd number, but most of the, the good spaces, the faction spaces, and in fact, all the faction spaces require at least two spice, right? Um, to use. So like two spice for 
Bene Gesserit, um, four spice for Emperor, six spice for high, Highliner, right? Um, so the odd number is kind of strange. It's almost like you don't have a spice sometimes, but it's it's fixed a little bit with Ix and Immortality. Um, there's more stuff to spend your spice on. The tech negotiation space really does kind of cut down on that odd number problem. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think I definitely think that five is a good number for for the the great flat, but definitely, you know, more more better. More is better usually. All right, uh, Cheesable, why don't you select the next strategy or tactic that you want to talk about? Well, um, <clears throat> even though I think this is one of Lenny's favorite, I think the, the one thing I want to talk about today is artillery. I think artillery leads for a lot of fun strategies. Like, artillery is a card that I don't think improves my win rate by a lot. But every time I play an artillery strategy, I am very happy. Um, there are two main <laughs> ways of playing uh, artillery deck. So one is... Um, is you kind of call your deck. So you play something like ECAS and you kind of pick up um, cards with swords and you kind of call away anything that doesn't have a sword. And um, generally things that are good for you are things that give you, draw you more cards. So like water, spice. Um, yes, you can go to uh, selective breeding or research station and just draw more cards. And you don't need a lot of troops, but your one troop can turn into like 16 strength very easily. Um, yeah, so that's I mean that's one way of playing it. You play an ECAS, or one way is just you, you just buy bad cards. <laughs> when I say bad cards, I mean like conventionally bad cards, which are like cost cards that cost like one to three. Anything that has a sword on it, you just purchase, and then you you have this suddenly you have this very thick deck. You have like a 20, 20 plus card deck <laughs> that just has a bunch <laughs> of swords in it, <laughs> and um. Uh, and every turn is you just see what you have and you just kind of play it out and you reveal for uh plus 12 combat strength yeah so um just to kind of expand on that um as cheese will relate there are two different uh, styles of uh, of artillery usage um i absolutely think it's a legit strategy i i use it a lot i think artillery ecas is something that uh, i go for almost 100 percent of the time um a secondary fallback to that is usually ariana so the two schools have a different methodology to them. ECAS provides you with consistency and effectiveness, but Ariana gives you that variability that confuses opponents at times. So the, the main weakness in artillery builds are you become predictable in how much swords you can produce every round because your deck is so small, you're pretty much generating 18 swords. So people know, okay, I need at least 20 swords to beat you out. And, you know, they got to count for your intrigues as well, but... You know, you're more predictable in that sense. But for someone like Ariana, where, you know, your sword count can be anywhere from 5 to 18, it's, it's just really difficult to deal with that. And spamming out Research Station, you also uh, have different variants in that if people kind of step in your way on the final rounds, as most people do because they're trying to buy Spice so Slow, that can be a bit of a, a problem for her. So uh, in my view... Um, Ariana's is a little bit more meme but um, ECAS for sure is a legit strategy on that end. Yeah, it's interesting. I know that, I mean, ECAS is very, very strong in Immortality, just the ability to make your deck so super consistent, and because the power level of cards has gone so so high through the roof, it makes a lot of sense that you can create a consistent combat deck with um, Artillery and ECAS. Um, I, I haven't seen it with Ariana, but maybe I guess I haven't seen you do it um, but I, I believe it because she just has so much quick access to research station at the same time she's, you know, going up the, um, experimentation track and getting extra bonuses and then eventually drawing extra cards. It seems pretty strong. So yeah, I can see it. Actually, just a kind of a cheap plug in, um, we were playing, um, immortality at, uh, in the Toronto meetup and I used that, uh, same build for Ariana just to kind of meme on them with the research station and daggers up and uh, i think there was four combats in a row where i managed to cycle back into um, helicopter joe and each time it was just four extra swords they were dealing with and uh, another troop that they uh, didn't account for that jump jumped in so it was it was very consistent on that level so if you know how to manipulate your deck the way uh, link does a great paul player um you can kind of bring that consistency uh, closer to yourself but yeah, for sure. ECAS is much easier to build around, I'd say. And uh, the the swords that you buy are important um, as well. You need to 
kind of focus down on certain cards. So, for example, um, a lot of people hate this card, Sardaukar Infantry. It uh, provides no fa faction access and only provides two swords. Well, with the artillery, it's three swords. So it's almost as if you're holding a Master Tactician in your hand. So It's crazy, yeah. Yeah, just having two of those in your, in your deck is two Master Tacticians at all times. And um, obviously Fidei can command those because that's four swords. It's an ambush in your hand as long as you've got another... Uh, uh, Fremen card as well so uh, another one the the most important one I feel is the uh, the Jesuit sister um, she provides you the Benny Jesuit access and she gives you two swords and uh, with the artillery it's just three swords so uh, a lot of the times you're trying to hit places like selective reading with that card or uh, falling back on that you can use that for for swords instead of persuasion so uh, she she is pretty much one of my core uh, cards that I need for that particular build. So for sure, I think it's a legit strategy. I think the strategy needs some support. So the the issue I I have with it is that um, you kind of need a, a means to to draw more cards. I mean that's that how that's how it fuels your artillery. So actually, one of the the cards which I really like in this deck is Duncan Idaho. So Duncan Idaho is a card which I generally don't like, but in this particular deck, it is crazy good like getting a uh, water on reveal you know it just fuels half a research station um other other things that are good i guess text like uh wind traps you know wind traps is, is great for this strategy there are a lot of combats you'll pick up for cheap and having that extra water to go to research station means that you will win another combat and if you happen to pick up imperial bashad <laughs> then all's great in the world <laughs> yeah that's actually the dream, right, is to get both of those together, artillery and, and Bashar. Yeah. Um, so I have I have from Black Shadow, who is currently transiting um, across the United States. He uh, has sent me a little write-up about this exact strategy. And he calls it Artillery Paul. And since we've already talked about Link's Paul a little bit, um, maybe this isn't much of a stretch, but I want to read what he wrote to me, wrote to me, and then we can all talk about it, okay? So it says, I have had a couple games where the in third position, I've taken Paul with the intentions of, to take artillery immediately, assuming first and second go some combo of fold space, smuggling, and hardy warriors. This coupled with a lot of cheap sword cards can make life really uncomfortable for others in combat. The great t uh, thing for Paul is that by drawing more cards with ring, and a couple trips to selective breeding, you're indirectly adding to your combat strength and allows loads of power with just a handful of troops. Even if signet, even just Signet Ring to Mentat or Arakeen and uh, deck cycling makes you hard to predict and any battle calculation is very difficult for others, which means you can roll over the mid-game fights with deterrence and overwhelm in the tier threes. By being third, it means you get first crack at Highliner in round seven to see to try and see the game out. With loads of cards on reveal you can still get a higher value stuff too like worm riders bashar and early shy with, with this uh, was nasty and means you can get stuff like sadakar infantry and even scout and save some extra troops here and there this is vital as you do need a couple troops in your garrison as much as possible to give flex and, and to deter to deter others in one of the matches i had three troops in back-to-back -back conflicts one round i had nine strength with, with reveal the other 20 it can make you nearly impossible to fight against without overcommitting a lot, which either leads to cheap mid-game wins or your opponent exhausting themselves and you cash in for tier 3 combats. You still have some flex to visit faction spaces and can realistically challenge both Fremen and Bene alliances, too, so points aren't being given up. Still suits his multi-purpose to shift a larger garrison, and the water allows both hardy warriors for more troops or research station for more swords. A well-timed research station can even secure a spice must flow on the side. It's also a lot of fun and allows for creativity, brinksmanship, and you're always involved in with what's going on. You do have to fully commit to the strategy, but some of the best Paul games have been doing this. Thoughts? I think that it's actually uh, pretty legitimate. Um, yeah. As I mentioned before, uh, with the card draw... Uh, edition you have a lot a lot of wild variants and that wild variance uh is something that can really mess people up as uh, i mentioned prior so it's definitely legitimate in my opinion um it's actually my third option for the artillery build so that's funny that uh, it was mentioned on that 
Um, so Ekaz, then uh, Ariana, then Paul. Okay. Oh, yeah. With no no Ilban uh, combat. Uh, Ilban just because in uh, I guess in Ix it's a lot more um, contested, but in Emo um, maybe not as much. So that's my one gripe with uh, Ilban, just because his his extra draw gets blocked a lot. Like when I was playing against the likes of say Drezo, oh man, I just kept on getting blocked and blocked and blocked, and I was just getting uh, an extra draw here or there, but it was costing me big time. So. Interesting. Um, yeah. for, for me personally, for my own experience, it's uh, a pain in the butt to deal with, and uh, I'd just rather the consistency of the ability itself rather than the passives. May I just chime in? Um, mm -hmm. I one thing about okay, so everything Black Shadow said about the strategy is true. The one thing I want to disagree with is that um, I don't think the Paul pick actually is that relevant to the strategy. You can do it with any any leader. Like any leader is fine. One thing about Paul is that um you play your ring like hopefully round one or round two. Or round one, like, hopefully round one you draw it, right? And then you have um it it, it becomes a very big uh persuasion round in generally, because you can kind of see what the top card is. You can kind of plan for your for your for your for your persuasion by that round. And actually, um when you're planning for Paul, you kind of want to have that one big card, right? You're you're trying to get one good card and you're cycling it into your first rotation. As such, it's not really it doesn't really hinge on artillery. Like how many times you play your ring throughout the game actually is not it's not very high. Like uh um, right, right. Yeah, once you make that big purchase, the card that you want to play is this 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 big card that you bought. Um and so, actually, when it comes to drawing cards and to fuel an artillery strategy, you aren't really playing your ring a lot. I mean, we can compare it to like the Ben Jezzer initiate. Like, how, when you buy it, how many times are you actually playing it? And I think when I play a lot of games, that card is often just sitting in my hand. So, do you think that it, the prescience ability is not very useful then for Paul in this situation? It seems kind of like it would actually help out a lot. I mean, but it's still like gambling, right? You you might have something on top of your deck that helps, or you might have garbage, and so what's the point, right? I think on average, you just want to draw like a lot of cards. Like it doesn't matter what cards, you just want to have a lot of swords in your deck, and you just want to draw all of them. So right, yeah. So I, I'm not sure if Paul's the best leader for it, but interesting. I, yeah. Maybe maybe Shadow has more plays on it than I do. So from my perspective, uh, the reason why it's like Ariana and uh, Paul make a great addition for this is. Um, the extra card draw makes a big difference in how much you can buy early on. So the strategy hinges on you making these type of purchases in the first two, three rounds. And you, you can only do so on that level. You can't afford yourself to keep building post uh, turn four, uh, round four, I mean, um, because you don't have that type of time. You're playing catch up because you're hitting non-faction based spots and you're buying non-faction based cards so um it's important to have that high persuasion and on that level those two characters do it better than uh ecaz in general just because of the extra card draw that they have um so uh i think that's one thing that she's well um, made a good mention of um the high uh, the high value card that you get um they do it easier than ecaz uh, ever could um, so when Ikaz lands that card, great. It's, it works infinitely better for the strategy, but only Paul and um, Ariana can do it more consistently on that level. So uh, that coupled with the disposal facility tech is tremendous. So um, that's why I think it, it is a legitimate strategy, just because their ability to acquire the big bang cards are uh, more consistent than Ikaz, for example. But that is super interesting and something you mentioned here I want to kind of touch on and something that Cheesable does in his strategy guide so go check those out online on uh, his channel but he always mentions what tech tiles favor those leaders and those strategies um, what tech tiles besides artillery of course are best for the strategy we're talking about this kind of like um, build for lots of swords you know call your deck sort of strategy or is it just the the two or are there others? Yeah, uh, so I would say um, if you can afford it, uh, you you should get the uh, Holtzman engine. Um, it uh, leads you into more Spice Must Flows. 
it leads you into additional cards, which is additional swords. Um, that one's more expensive, so I would say that's a late game purchase. Uh, definitely not an early game purchase. Um, easiest uh, pick up after the artillery is the uh, the wind traps. Uh, allows you to keep diving into combat nonstop, uh, draw, drawing extra cards where people are struggling to even get their water, and definitely the combat. Um, the other addition I like is the restricted ordinance. It's overkill, but it basically guarantees that the entry fee is substantially higher than anything else anybody can afford. Those would be the mainstay uh, text that I would go with. Yeah, I agree. Wind traps. Wind, wind traps is, is is the key. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. But you um, you mentioned or Lannister mentioned um, the culling card. What is that one? It's, disposal um, facility. Disposal facility. Yeah. And so is that one a necessary car, uh, tech or is it just like, you know, tech of opportunity, use it, get it when you can, but don't like focus on it? Uh, it's not necessary for ECAS because calling twice right. around is just excessive in my opinion. Uh, but it is a very good addition to uh, Ariana as well as Paul, just because you want to drive out the offenders. Like even at times I'll, I'll take out like daggers just because there's better dagger cards than the dagger card itself. So you want to have higher impact cards and uh, it creates that consistency for you very well and when you're drawing that much you're bound to get the six persuasion at some at some points or most points so it uh, doesn't lose its value over time got it well let's uh let's move on i think we all kind of like agree that this is a meta strategy it's something we need to be paying attention to um lanny why don't you introduce the next one uh, so there's a number of uh, videos where uh, we talked briefly about the Sonic Snooper Beast strategy. Yes, let's do that. Yeah. Um, so the strategy behind this is your first turn, you immediately go and grab the Sonic Snoopers with Beast. Uh, reason being is because Beast starts with an extra spice in Solari, and so he's able to acquire that two, uh, two tech cost uh, uh, technology. So the idea behind it is to acquire as many intrigues as possible, going through Carthag and Secrets, as well as getting um, the, uh, oh, I'm brain farting this. What's the four, four, four spice tech um, that uh, breaks tiebreakers? Oh, Loki. Yeah. Oh, Chomarky. Chomarky, yeah. yes. Chomarky as well. Um, so the idea behind this is to get the benefits of the extra bumps uh, that uh, you would get in the intrigues. The intrigues, I think, uh, something close to one and eight. One in eight or one in nine cards can get you a bump in uh, one of the faction spaces. Um, one in five cards is a combat card, and one in ten is a VP type of card. So you're you're gambling, but at the same time, the Sonic Snoopers allows you to uh, cycle out all the ones that are trash for yourself. <laughs> now, what people will tell me that is, oh, it's it's too much of a Russian roulette here, but when you keep hitting Carthag and you keep hitting Secrets, it creates that fear as well. So when you go into combat and you dish out two troops, the other person has to consider how many combat intrigues you have in your hand. And most of the times, if you're uh, pushing into combat, you can't afford to be second place, or at least most times you can't afford to be second place. If you're fully committing, you're going to have to spend those resources. So Let's say you did, you did know that I had those combat cards, two ambushes in my hand. You're going to have to push in all those extra troops just to w win that battle. And I still get to keep those cards because I don't have to spend them. So mm -hmm. I can use that to basically hostage you guys into fighting very, very expensive battles. Or I can just win the day at the key moments uh, that it happens. So um, at certain points, I think the cutoff is you trade in six six intrigues for uh, six intrigues if it really gets that bad. Um, the idea is to get rid of most of the VP cards if you got them too early. So um, I know a lot of people are going to bash me for this, but I toss, <laughs> out, I toss out corner market and plans like no tomorrow. Like if those are the first two cards I see with Sonic Snoopers and Beast, I usually toss them out because they're not going to be happening. I'm trying to end the game by uh, anywhere from turn six, turn seven, and I'm not going to meet those conditions anytime soon. So that's the idea behind the strategy. Have you seen this strategy, Cheesable? I, I, I mean, I've seen um, those game where Sneaker Dead was, Dead was playing it, I think, uh, in, the, <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the tournament. So it, it came up. Um, 
I'm not so sure whether it was like um, he he had it in mind. Like it was kind of like um, the tech is there. I might as well buy it. Um, and Lenny talks about it, and he has. I think he has boasted about a turn five win with this. Um, yeah. When I think about it, like you know, I try to analyze it, like think about like cost benefits, and you know, like it's just. I don't think like I don't think it's a very reliable strategy. I think that there are definitely times you can high roll to a win this way, um, but I I mean I I'm, I I lean more towards the 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 meme side of this strategy. The the reasoning is that. Let's let's say if it wasn't Sonic Snooper, so we always replace it with something else, right? So let's say if it was uh, Memo Quarters that grants you interstellar shipping access from a good position, or it is artillery that just gives you a bunch of swords now and then. Like, is Sonic Snooper's death much better? And when I weigh the two, I don't think that Sonic Snooper's uh, really carries me to, to victory. Yeah, I I mean, I played the strategy a couple times, I think, with you in the game, Lannister, and I think it did okay. But I also think that this is the strategy, like, obviously, you have to, like, refine it. It's something that you hold very dear to you. So, again, I'm not as good as, as, as executing this as you are. Um, when I thought I did okay with it, and I thought it, it felt like a second like like a second place kind of strategy like i could do good enough but it generally i fall in the second place um i definitely you can win with it for sure like you can totally high roll and um that seems really fun and uh but i think it's a little bit too like i said you, even you said like, it's a little russian roulette -y. it's a little bit too much of like just random chance to see what you get um but when it works it's it's pretty fun uh i still think it's a little bit memey though I can certainly see that because uh, when you're trying to like, go for a winning strategy, it's a consistency that you want, and it's hard to be consistent, especially when there, there, there's a ton of new uh, immortality intrigues as well. Um, what I allude to for this is the the fear factor and the cost benefit yeah. for, for that part. I think that makes a big play as to why that strategy works consistently for me. Um, so... Uh, when it comes to combat, um, uh, by reputation, most people know that I make combat very expensive to, to, to take. There's no one or two cube combats when I'm playing the game. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, specifically, I'll sometimes throw in one troop with no combat cards in mind, and you know I'll, I'll get second place. Or you know um, there there are a lot of opportunities where you gain this extra resource or this extra win because people aren't willing to fully commit into you and I think that is an additional part of what makes that strategy great not just in what you acquire but what the possibility drives the fear in the other people so that's why I, I think it does work because it's not just about what you have it's like uh, Texas Hold'em like you could have two sevens sure. as if you had you know six cards you know, what are the chances that all of them are really crap cards, right? So I, I definitely agree. There, there is something to be said for the fear of those intrigues. I mean, that's that's important. But I think what I'm hearing is that you're in some way leaning into your reputation as a skilled combat player and people take your word for it in some <laughs> way. Um, and so you can kind of get away with that a little bit more than I can. I'm more of a balanced player, I think. I play a little bit of, of everything. And so I think that that doesn't it doesn't work for me as well. Um, but I mean, I need to try it some more. It is super fun to do. And if you are out there and you're like, oh, I tried the Sonic Snoopers thing, just try it. It's like go beast and go Sonic Snoopers. It is fun. Just keep getting intrigues. Don't even care if they steal an intrigue from you because most of them are going to suck. And you just like keep keep racking them in. It's real fun. Lenny, I have a question for you. Do you think yeah. that with the immortality intrigues, do you think this strategy has gotten better or worse? For sure, it's gotten worse. Uh, the immortality yeah. intrigues have uh, weakened uh, the strategy, uh, mainly because a lot of the intrigues have um, uh, level up features to it, like Vicious Talons, for example, where it gets two swords at the initial research, then four, then six. Um, then there's like um, a Gruesome Sacrifice, where you're g giving up your troops to get uh, specimen cubes and stuff like that. None of that stuff I want to see. I, I want to win fights. I don't want to lose right. fights. 
so it super diluted the uh the bumps didn't it yeah for sure and there there are more end game vp type stuff i I really dislike that when i go with the strategy because it means you have to hold on to them and it never feels good to chuck out uh, vp for for anything so um i'd say cj's is definitely correct it's a um a reputational type of thing as well um but uh, certainly um when someone's holding you know six or seven intrigues it's uh, definitely going to give you a second consideration and i would definitely commit a lot more than the standard amount to to beat someone with seven intrigues in their hand okay so i guess that's my turn to go and we're going to talk about a different strategy one we've talked about several times on this channel i think and one that uh you popularized lannister so that's why i'm going to talk about it (laughs) Uh, I hope that's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Um, so this is the I pick Leto, I take Carino jeans, and then I buy two uh, Dreadnoughts by round two. The way that this works is you have to have Leto. Carino jeans needs to be in the Tylaxu row, and you probably need to be first or second. Um, best if you're first. And what you do is you immediately go to wealth. This requires you, by the way, to hit one of your... Um, access cards uh so one in five chance to hit your access card it's not terrible but it's not great um you hit your access card you go to to wealth and then your second action is to go to dreadnoughts and with leto you get a discount so you can go to dreadnoughts for two solari you pick up your dreadnought and uh you you know move on with your life that's your first round in the second round you hit up um or sorry, uh, when you buy, you buy Carino jeans for one of your specimens because you likely revealed for a specimen. Um, get to Solari, and then your first action of round two is to go back to Dreadnoughts, pick up your second Dreadnought, and then in the third a- in your second action is you're going to throw them into combat with like Carthag or something like that, and just start laying waste to people. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so I can attest to the strategy being pretty strong. Um, there's a couple of things that I have to say about it after playing it a couple times. Um, the first is is that if you can get those things, those stars to align, and your Leto, and you can get your two dreadnoughts in by round two, holy crap, is that powerful! It feels so good. It feels so good to just throw two troops in essentially for six strength, and people are like, uh okay, now I have to overcommit and you get to keep your dreadnoughts. That feels good. I've had a game where I was playing Leto and tried to, get, tried to stab it, tried to do this, and I didn't, get, I didn't get my access card round one, and that felt bad. So I had to go smuggling, which is fine, you know, and then do some other stuff. And that's not too bad either, because you can still do it round three. Getting early dreadnoughts is fine, but the round two dreadnoughts, it's cool. I think it's a little bit, like it's it's like borderline for me like it if it were more consistent i'd say it would be a strong meta strategy otherwise i think it's like if everything goes well do it kind of thing so actually i was playing a game right and um saw streaming one day and paul denon came into the video and he came into the stream and he was just chatting and he was talking about his dreams of um playing the beast and going well and then Going to tech negotiators, grabbing artil- or oh, going dreadnoughts, action uh, round one, action two, and grabbing dreadnoughts and artillery. So, so, so that that's his dream, and, and it hasn't happened yet. Um, <laughs> and I think there are very similar like concepts when we were talking about this. You know, getting an early dreadnought and how strong it is in the game. Uh, I played a game with Lannister, and he he actually did this. Uh, the video's up on my channel as well. So he he does get dreadnoughts early, and I can tell you that when playing against it, it feels. Um, it feels like you cannot win combat, um, so you kind of like you kind of give up combat to the player, and you just get like the lower, uh, <clears throat> unless you're really like going high line or something. You just get second or third place, but you also know you cannot win, so you don't commit too many troops into it, and you just try to get your your uh, compensation in other places like swordmaster or interstellar, interstellar shipping. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I one thing about this strategy is that. I'm 
I, I think that being able to throw the Dreadnought into combat round two, I think that's a very crucial part of the strategy. I think around, in like, let's say you're investing this amount much, much resources and you're putting it in round three, I think that's a bit late. However, round two, I think it's a good time to put it in. And the other thing that I think is important to this strategy is Corino Jeans. I, I, I really love this card. Like, um, every time I see it, I, I'll buy it. Uh, and I think there are a lot of people who play Dune who are underestimating two Solari early in the game. And that's why it's going around to Leto. <laughs> but yep. yeah, uh, I think as the, as people figure out the value of these two Solari, uh, I don't think this, this strategy will be as repeatable. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I have to agree with uh, you on that level. Um, definitely, a lot of people underestimating it. I, I had a Carino Jeans uh, touted as a a a, uh, a class card in the beginning uh, first two rounds. So, post that it can be debated, but yeah, it's essential uh, for that matter. Um, for what CJ said in terms of consistency, in terms of uh, aligning the stars to hit the, the jackpot, um, even if you don't land the jackpot just having leto have that discount for other things uh, it works very well so it can lead to um, early sword master and early uh high council even you know get you two trips to um to uh, mentat or anything of that effect so uh, on that level i wouldn't i wouldn't uh i wouldn't not take carino jeans just because of that miss but in terms of the uh the Dreadnought combo, it's really powerful stuff. Um, uh, in that particular match with Cheesable, um, I dominated combat for, I think, the first five, six rounds. And uh, I think it was only until finally that Cheesable got sick of it and he just converted all his resources over to Restricted Ordnance and all that other stuff that he started taking over. But prior to that, it was going really well. And uh, unfortunately, I think uh, Sneaker got fed up with it as well and he just chucked in <laughs> like everything on the final round of conflict two and it was like i think 20 something strength and it was just like oh man he's making me pay pay the whole town for this and it just became a cakewalk for uh, a cheesable in the a tier three conflicts because i ran out of juice at that point so um i think that's one of the weaknesses of that build is your your constantly feeling compelled to take advantage of the uh the vp combats and it kind of mistimes you at, at certain points like sometimes you really need to use your signet ring to get that spice or um go to uh other access points but you know you're so strong you kind of have to feel compelled to go in when it's a vp combat so um th that is one of the major weaknesses that i found with that build is just that power consumes you uh, or at least it does for me. No, no, we don't have to go all in on the the dreadnought plan, right? If you just go Leto Carino jeans, like as you mentioned, that leaves you pretty flexible and open to even get an early swordmaster, right? I mean, you're you're that or or uh, mentat or plenty of other things. Like you're not out of the game. Uh, you just play good Leto, right? You just play a good game, um, doing your you know core stuff of building your economy getting your resources, getting your sword master and, and continuing on, you know, climbing tracks and that. So even if you, you commit to it with like a, a turn one wealth, a turn one action, one wealth, it's even, I called it a turn around one action, one wealth, and then uh, bought Carino jeans with the expe expectation of getting um, your dreadnought round two. And it doesn't work. Like maybe someone else gets there first, you know, and you're out of order, you're out of turn order. It's not the end of the world, right? Mm. Yep, that's definitely true. That that flexibility uh, is great. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I think uh, Cheeseball and I really like Carino jeans, especially on Lido. Like that discount Solari is like much more valuable for him than anybody else, I would say. And uh, yeah, uh, going back to that dreadnought strategy, the the dreadnought strategy you don't have to technically do two uh, dreadnoughts into combat immediately. Just for everyone's understanding, you can do first action Hardy Warriors and then grab your Dreadnought. That also works too. Um, the reason why I say that is sometimes necessary is because sometimes people want to get in your way and they shove in right. the Hardy Warriors. And since you're only able to put in two Dreadnoughts and a troop, that's also a strength of eight. So they they kind of push you and go like, well, 
is your eight better than my eight? Well, technically, you can go Hardy Warriors first and then grab your Dreadnought. It's not too late, and you know that Dreadnought's going to be ready for round two anyway. So or round three anyway. So you're you're going to be fine. Do you think that for players who are who are going to try to pick up this strategy, that they should first start to just um, work at basics for Leto, like general pacing and tempo plays like that going to hardy warriors you know still navigating the board just don't tunnel vision right that's what i'm hearing you say yeah exactly it, it's it's about achieving your goals but being flexible about how you achieve them the main thing is getting the two dreadnoughts whether or not you you send both in in that combat is irrelevant it, what matters is you win the combat and you have two dreadnoughts by the end of uh, round two so I would say that's the mainstay goal of that build. One thing about playing against this strategy, right? So against playing, so let's say you're playing someone against someone who has a lot of swords in their deck or have, has dreadnoughts that they're constantly putting in. One thing is that how you should play against it, right, is that you should just kind of limp into combat. So you should just like put in one true and just lose the combat but you win in terms of value so you put in a one troop and you maybe you get third place and if even if you don't get third place like other people are putting in more troops than you to get third place so so what that results in across the entire game right is that when le- so so back to like the game that i played with sneaker and and lannister where lannister went two dreadnoughts right is that when it comes to round seven and round eight right because the other players haven't been putting in a lot of troops they kind of have like a garrison build up that they have like this one combat where they okay i'm gonna shove here and hopefully it's enough you know and if it's not enough then that that's okay as well that's a really good point that when you're doing this plan when you're trying to commit to any strategy you have to consider like what your monopolization on any particular element of the game is doing to other players right in this case it's causing them to stockpile and they're just gonna wait and go for it when they need to, right? Yep, for sure. Um, I think just as a final word on this uh, subject, uh, Helicopter Joe makes this strategy so strong. Um, you literally just dump in two dreadnoughts, and you decide if you want to send in that extra troop, and that's basically uh, eleven swords right there. Right? So, Wait, can you throw in dreadnoughts with Helicopter Joe? No, you Joe? send up, you send in two troop, uh, two dreadnoughts into combat, okay, and then you leave the troops behind. And then when you reveal, you send in one troop or cube in there. So like you have oh, I see. two, like two from the extra swords. Yeah, two from the cube, three from the swords, and then six from the dreadnoughts. That's eleven strength from that. So uh, helicopter Joe makes this strategy unbelievably strong. And by helicopter Joe, by the way, for those of you who are tuning in and are like, "What the hell card is that?" Uh, <laughs> that is the gunthopter. Um, right, so four coster that has is it desert symbol? Yeah. No, it has. It, yeah, it, it is it just des- desert and a, uh, a city? city axis? Yeah. Okay, and it it says that when you play it, you uh, everyone loses a troop in their garrison, and it also reveals for three swords, and you may throw uh, up to two troops into combat. Is that or no, it's one. one one troop from the garrison. one troop into combat? So it's effectively worth five swords when you reveal it. Which is pretty strong. It's uh, insane. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> one thing. One thing I want to mention about dreadnoughts in particular. So I know this strategy is a uh, immortality specific strategy because you need Corino genes to get your two dreadnoughts. But dreadnoughts overall in immortality are a lot stronger. Um, so in in X, both um, Beast and Lido can get dreadnought round one, but. In immortality, right, the strength of a dreadnought is, is a lot stronger because somehow when you play the game, somehow people are going to city spaces less and are getting less troops overall. You you very often run into rounds four and five where you have like o- almost empty garrisons across the board and just having a, a troop that you can redeploy constantly is very strong. So I do think that overall dreadnoughts as a whole are a lot stronger in immortality. That's a really good point too. I think that's... Something where we haven't really been distinguishing, but obviously we're talking about immortality here. Um, Ix is a different beast entirely, plays a little bit differently. Um, and for a long time, players have thought that Dreadnoughts were not very good. Um, but then somehow they got unlocked and everyone started playing them and they became kind of a meta thing. Or maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit. Maybe they're meme. But uh, yeah, they seem to be showing up a lot more and they seem to be um, doing a lot of work. So 
yeah, um, I think it's a really important distinction to make. Thank you. Cheesable, would you like to go through the next or tell us the next tactic or strategy that you'd like to talk about? So the next tactic I would like to talk about is um, buying a three cube uh, Twilight Suit card as early as round one. So you do this by first paying your faction access card to steel suits and then your other card, uh, be it a reconnaissance or your signet ring to research station. And hopefully you draw into both your experimentations and the research will grant you an additional Twilight Suit cube. And using these three cubes, you're able to buy something off the, off the row and no one else can stop you as long as you go to steel suits. Um, early and you have I mean you if you have both experimentations in hand at the start then you already know you have it and even round two unless someone does something similar it's unlikely that they are able to uh, to snatch this three costed uh, target card from you so you can do this for some of the more powerful cards and I think Stitch Horror is the one that really shines in this strategy I think this is a legitimate meta strategy I think it's also potentially a problem strategy <laughs> um but yeah the idea that you can buy the best cards in the game from the tilaxu row and no one can do anything about it is kind of a problem um but yeah it's it's very strong getting stitched horror i think even getting gola early is okay but it's not great stitch horror has the quickest return um has the best actions uh, action box um maybe also uh, promo Piter. Promo Piter is very good, um, but it's a little bit like you don't really want that early. You kind of want it mid mid game to start buying Spice Must Flows. Um, are there any other cards you'd be targeting, or is it just Stitch Tour? Stitch Tour and Piter. And Piter, yeah. Well, it might be not be a three carder, but uh, that strategy still works great for the T Lax Infiltrator because you can cycle into it immediately. So yeah, that's a great addition. I heard a guy. Uh, Give it a extremely high rating. <laughs> familiar with it? <laughs> yeah, I, I might might be familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's a legit strategy. Um, there's two major benefits to it. You get the the really high quality uh, two or three coster uh, Tlax card, but the addition of it is also the infinite possibilities you get from having a high persuasion. Um, and this is where I think it lays waste to the landscape of possibilities. Um, I'll give you a very specific example. Um, I bought something as simple as Embedded Agent, which is um, a five cost card. Uh, it only has green access. And it basically says, if you have played a Benny Gesserit before uh, playing this card, then you get two shipping bumps. So it's also the infiltrate card, right? For green? Yep, inf infiltrate for green. Yeah, correct. Um, so. Imagine having obtained that card and having stitched horror. <laughs> that allows you to put that card into combat. Quite like, not even counting whatever Gola does, just having stitch horror with that, having two, two shipping bombs. So I'll, I'll let you decide how strong that is. Since I was Hundro for that particular game. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I yeah, you're, you're, you're hearing that right. I gave up shipping. Just to take that strategy into account, I was like, I saw Stitch Horror, I'm like, I'm going for it. And when I when I got shipping, like I, I was going three, four times as uh, spice shipping around, depending upon, you know, whether I had uh, the uh, Mentat for that particular thing. It was, it was just uh, amazing stuff. And the possibilities you have with the grafting of city access for non-city access based cards, such as uh, X Guild Combat Compact, or. Uh, uh, the embedded agent, as I mentioned, it, it leads to such powerful combinations that you end up getting a lot of benefits for combat as well as access without hitting the access points. Like you, you get the, the, the bumps, you get the techs, you get the troops, all that and more. So yeah, it's definitely mm -hmm. a legit strategy. So does everyone think this is a legit strategy? Cheesable, you thought this is legit too? Yes, this is Kelly meta. Um, yeah. It, it is it is very strong the the one downside to the strategy is that you you kind of want a very specific combination of cards in your first hand to to do it like the your dream hand right is that you must have uh seek allies right and mm -hmm. then the other card then you ideally you want your experimentations in hand then you also want to have blue blue access so ideally these are the, the things that need to line up 
right? If you have one experimentation in hand, you still can consider it and try to high roll for it. But if you have your seat allies in your deck, um, playing your diplomacy, then going to research station and drawing your your seat allies feels very bad. Um, and and so that's something that doesn't feel very good for me when I play this strategy. But but I think if you do grab Stitch Horror or, or Piper round one and you cycle it into your deck and you can draw it round two, it is, is amazing. I have to mention though, there's one uh, weakness to this particular um, strategy is you end up leaving uh, very integral spots open for your opponents. Um, yes. So we'll, we'll dive into that in a bit, uh, but uh, uh, there's a smuggle smuggle strategy. You, you kind of give that up. And the other thing is your anti-hostaging the spice. You're basically saying to all the other players, here, take all the spice in the world. I, I, I have no qualms about you taking that stuff, um, unless it is a stitch horror, uh, which can acquire that water again. But yeah, you, you end up uh, giving them a lot of extra resources with that strategy. So you, you, you must be cognizant that that's the payoff that you're willing to give up for whatever uh, Tlax card you're aiming for. Well, let's, let's do the next one then. Um, you mentioned it. Uh, this our round two swordmaster, and I, I know that Cheesable, you think very highly of this. Um, you have a whole video on it. Um, you go smuggle uh, round one, action one. You smuggle again, action t action one of uh, the second round, and then you just cash out. Get the Solari. Uh, go get swordmaster, and profit, and that's and then you just win the game, <laughs> right? No, <laughs> but tell us a little bit about that. That's. That's a pretty big uh, new meta strategy. Okay, so 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 whatever CJ described is correct. You just smuggle round one, you smuggle round two, and from combat or playing specific leaders, you can get the extra salary to buy your round two sword master. So in particular in immortality, what we have found out is that just playing more cards is good. There's a lot of uh, playing experimentations to Imperial Basin with a plus one is good. Playing it to Imperial Basin with a plus zero is not the worst as well. Like just getting a just getting a research symbol, it just furthers your game in so many ways. So, so when I played, my my win rate just started spiking. Like every time I see someone like getting early sword master, like the the likelihood that they win the game or threaten the win of the game is is really really high. So much so that it has kind of bled back into the rise of X meta. So rise of X meta, no one used to like. Smuggle, smuggling used to be like average at best, but pe now people in Rise of X as well are just going up and down and, and getting Sword Master early. So one of the things that also feeds into the strategy is that there are a lot of um, Tylex 2 cards, right, that, that give you faction access. Like, things like Contaminator, Face Dancer, uh, and, and because you have very cheap faction access that you don't really need to work for as well, um, anytime you have an extra action and you can go to faction ex space, that is like uh, almost half a point. So this, mm -hmm. these are the various reasons of why this strategy is, is very strong and, and how, how, why I'm very excited to see how the upcoming tournament plays out with, um, with regards to uh, early Swordmaster. Yep, I, I agree. Um, as a, an individual who despises the Swordmaster, um, when we started talking strategy, me and Cheesable and the Sneaker, uh, I, I started listening. I was like, all right, let's try it. And, as soon as I started trying, I was like, oh, my, my wins are a lot easier. Uh, win rate is always going to be variable, but you can feel the comfort in it. And the whole idea that your experimentations uh, advance you on this track that provides resources is highly beneficial. So um, in the past, when you're playing Ix, you know, you play your Dune the Desert Planet, you get one Spice or one Solari going to smuggling. That doesn't really do much, but world of a difference for um, immortality because these extra cubes even if you're not going to be using it to buy the, the cards or to advance the beetle track it can be used at a three to two three to two conversion rate for troops which as cheesable mentioned is a is a major resource that is sorely lacking uh, and having that conversion possibility really uh, amplifies the the usage of the, the experimentation cards. So uh, even something as simple as having only one access card and two experimentations played, that's an amazing round for you. If you're able to play both your experimentations as well as the uh, as well as the uh, access card, you're you're basically golden. 
but the only way you can do that is um, smuggle smuggle, which allows you the maximum opportunity to spike those uh, those resources. And uh, I have to say, even though I am very um, very adamant of, against the Swordmaster, it, it's becoming more transparent to me that it's uh, uh, probably the meta strategy, and I may be forced to go against my own. I was going to say, like most of your strategies that you've come up with for Ix or or Emeritality, uh, kind of rely on you timing your Swordmaster to about round five or six so that you can then utilize it in the last couple rounds of the game. But this is a completely different like side of um, the game, right? Like this is saying actions are better. Like playing cards are better than revealing them. Um, I would rather be playing cards, getting lots of actions, lots of different effects than holding onto things and buying Spice Mist Flow. I mean, you could still do that, you usually can, but um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's it's a, it's a legit strategy. This is one of the things I think is most interesting about this new meta is see what happens and how people adjust to it, whether blocking or just not taking Solari to fuel um, other leaders, you know, just like going up and up and up. Um, how this sort of works uh, i think it's it's fascinating but yeah definitely meta for me you yeah, for sure uh, just as a small note here um the major difference is when i don't go swordmaster i'm aiming for a turn seven win and when she's will goes with swordmaster he's going for a turn seven win the approach mm. is different because for me i'm giving up the, these extra actions by taking advantage of the early uh, combat and opportunities that other people miss the main reason the strategy is uh, better overall on Cheesable side is consistency. Uh, you know what you're getting when you're hitting those tracks and all those uh, other resources. But in, in combat, you're not able to define whether you're going to get terrible purpose or if you're going to get the uh, trade monopoly for shipping in uh, a troop or something like that. It, it's just highly variable and there's more elements in your control uh, with this side of what uh, Cheesable's uh, recommendation is on that level. So uh, that's why I think it's uh, uh, more consistent on that level. Does it kill the two um, agent romber strategy? Um, it doesn't necessarily kill it. Uh, the, the major thing is whether or not your combats uh, align for you. So um, what what the strategy he does is he's almost guaranteed to end turn seven, turn eight. Whereas with my strategy, uh, I'm ending from six, seven, eight, but it's very difficult to say if I'm going to end in six or eight, because if there's a, a drought of VP combats, I'm really screwed and I can only win by turn eight at that point. Whereas, you know, cheesable strat is, well, uh, I can get all these resources and all these bumps and, uh, I'll just, you know, dive into one VP combat, and that's good enough to get a turn seven win consistently. And that's one thing I I really think that is uh, great about Cheesable and watching his videos is he's very consistently making that turn seven victory happen. Yeah, absolutely agreed. There's there's not much way to stop it as well. <laughs> <laughs> so so the the issue with this right, if let's say you're player one, you go to smuggle like action one. You don't get any compensation for your your action. You block the table, but you don't like you you don't get any benefit from it whatsoever. So uh, I I'm not so sure if like let's say last if if the the contention was intercell stripping and spacing friendship right. If you go to action one full space and player two gets uh full like intercell stripping somehow right. Your compensation is that you know you are one step ahead of him, like your 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 in terms of player position. So the moment you get uh, interstellar stripping access, you block him for the rest of the for the rest of the game. Um, so that is your mm. compensation. But with smuggling, I don't think there is um, any compensation by uh, to the player one to actively block the player two. So <laughs> this this is this is one of the um, the contention points to try to think about. But I, I'm, I, I don't really have a counterpoint to countering this strategy as well. I just hope I'm the one who gets Swordmaster. <laughs> well, all right, let's move on. Who's next? Um, Lenny, are you next or am I next? Uh, I think I was next. Go for it. 
Uh, so there is a strategy involving the one big combat win. Uh, this is basically uh, something that uh, I like to do a lot. It's uh, something particular to Hundro for me. Um, it might be for other people as well. But the idea behind the strategy is to sit on a lot of odd levels of the Axis track. So you're on either level 1 or level 3 and you're still about hitting up level 4 of multiple tracks. And at the start of turn 7, you dive in and you collect 5 points or more by getting the 2 tracks, a beetle point, and the combat for 2 VP. And if you're lucky enough, even a spice must flow for 6 and etc. So the, the strategy uh, is basically uh, acting meek. And the reason you want to act meek is because other people are going to be chasing the leaders. Um, and this is actually very particular to um, the weakness in my usual strategy of uh, early game rushdown. Early game rushdown, people see you as a threat, and they just dive after you nonstop, and that really hurts, especially if they successfully manage to uh, steal one of your alliances or um, hit you in combat when it's a key moment. So acting meek for, before the final moment is actually, uh, in my opinion, a very strong strategy because um, when you lay down six points in one round, there's not a whole lot people can do to react to it. And it requires a lot of uh, aggressive analyzation and possible table talk to kind of bring everybody up to speed as to what's about to transpire. So yeah, that's the idea behind the strategy. Now, this kind of relies on you winning a combat with a specific tech, doesn't it? Uh, it, it does, but it also doesn't. Um, so it, it helps if you have uh, the uh, in, in, is it Invasion Fleet. The one Detonation? Yeah. Or I thought, yeah, you're thinking of Invasion Fleet. I was thinking of Detonation Devices, but go ahead. Yeah, it can also be that. Uh, as long as it's a combat win that gets you five or six points, that's what I mean by the one big combat win. But Detonation Devices is uh, one of the mainstay and cheap, affordable ones. Um, Invasion Fleet basically secures the win for you. Um, but the main thing is to be able to do all of that in one shot, um, which the easiest function is through shipping at the final moment. Um, so this can be achieved with Hundro. Uh, this can be achieved by cards that allow you to, to go uh, into city or combat spaces uh, with uh, shipping, so, such as high priority travel, for example, or expedite. Um, all of those are key moments that you can drop down and you can get a bunch of points. And I think one of the main weaknesses in uh, other players is not recognizing immediately the threat that is on the table. Um, people just see oh, he's at 7 VPs and uh, he's at 3 VPs, therefore 7 VPs is the guy to go after. Not necessarily. You got to look at the whole situation and that is why that strategy works so, so well because you, you, you can obviously dive under the radar for the longest time and just take out a lot of people. Uh, let me chime in. Let me chime in on this. So, so there's one entry card that I think everyone hates and that is Diversion. But actually, Diversion is a card that has won me quite a lot of games, and I don't hate drawing it. In fact, whenever I draw Diversion, right, I, I always set up for this strategy. You know, you, you, you go up high on the, the shipping track, either 2 or 3. Then you set up your Emperor to be at 3 influence, and you go. You can just go to Hardy Warriors, put in 4 troops, or maybe go to Highliner, put in 5 troops, you ship down, and suddenly you put in another 4 troops, 2 from shipping, 2 from Emperor, because of diversion shipping down and um all in all is a lot of points you get a point from your let's say the emperor alliance you get a point from let's say your friend and friendship you get a point two points from the combat as well then and then there are multiple techs you can buy which also turn into points um and overall the the, the like i think with hundred maybe it's a bit more telegraph but with diversion right it is so sneaky like no one can really plan for it like who is going to plan around a diversion right and um yeah i i that's that's one reason if i have a lot of videos on diversion like i i, I do not know like i know a lot of people hate on it but if you actually watch like look at all the videos i have like at least two or three wins that are diversion based and the, all of them once i get diversion i set it up i i i 
intentionally set it up. I set up uh, go to Emperor, get the three influence, and I'm just waiting for that moment to like have this one big moment in the game. So uh, I'll briefly mention this. I think you're right that their version has the opportunity to do that, but what if I say I block, uh, you know, um, Hardy Warriors, right? Like, wouldn't Expedite be infinitely better? I, I can just go into Arakeen and put in one troop and pull off the same maneuver. Right? That version is a terrible one, in, in contrast to Expedite, for example, right? I mean, one spice is very affordable, in my opinion. Yeah, both of them are fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, agreed. What I mean, Diversion is an interesting card. You just have to... It, it does work. You know, it can win you games. It's just one of those things you have to really work to get it all to work together. Um, I always find, like, I get... When I try to do it, I get blocked on, like, Hardy Warriors. and It's very high, hotly contested space, like, game. So um, I do really like that play. I think getting to the third space of the Emperor and then, like, using shipping to kick in a couple extra troops is such a strong tactic and it's something that is easily overlooked by a lot of players like they they don't see it coming they're like oh yeah well I'll just um you know they're not they're not the alliance yet I don't have to worry about that and then they win a combat they get you and you get the alliance and so on in one try and one shot it's it's pretty good so I, I guess we're all in agreement that it's a meta strategy then I think for Hanjo is a is is a meta strategy for and the other, for the other leaders I think it's very opportunistic like it's not something that you can uh really plan for like it's something at, at the middle of the game you can you must see what resources you have and see that can can I set it up yeah but I think that for immortality the ability to cull cards from the secting kit such as a, a secting kit with the freighter fleet for instance I think things like that they, they just uh, add more possibilities for non-shipping classes to, to do it. So I think it's still Hondro's you know, work of art, but other opportunities uh, are available for non-Hondro characters too, especially in immortality. Yeah, agreed. Mind if I go next with one? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, of course. Okay, so uh, this is a strategy that involves essentially doing nothing that impacts your opponents just trying to go up friendship tracks get alliances and buy spice must flows um it is often a, uh, attempted when someone is playing tessia and it is sometimes accomplished with uh, the baron but most of the time it's a very passive strategy where you just go up tracks buy spice must flows and try to win the game at about 10 points um, so I like that you call this the solitaire strategy, achievable. I think that this is a, a good, good name for it, but I don't think Dune Imperium anymore is very, I mean, you could almost get away with doing this, uh, with the base game. You could, you could kind of do this with, uh, Helena a little bit and sometimes in immortality, sorry, sorry, in, in Ix, you could do this with Tessia, but I don't think it works anymore in immortality. I think it's a very difficult strategy and most of the time what I found is, and I've done this sometimes because I like testing out solitaire strategies myself in most games I play just to see if they're broken, is that I get to 10 points and then get like completely jumped by someone else who was sitting on extra points or got the last combat and I wasn't able to, you know, get quite there. I'd be do fine, but would come up a bit short. So for me, this is a, a meme -y strategy where... You're just kind of like griefing a little bit and you're letting other people um, take combats and ship and do things that you probably would have been better off doing. Yeah, so my, my take on it is slightly different. I think at the base, this is a very fundamentally sound strategy. Like, if you are if you are set up to buy Spice Must Flows anywhere from round 5 onwards, so 5, 6, 7, right? I think um, that, that constitutes... Like good deck building, good resource management, and like what what so what you're giving up, right? Is let's say I'm giving up combat or I'm getting giving up a combat point, but when you buy a spice and slow, yes, you dilute your deck a little bit, but you are still getting a point, right? So net net, both of us get a point. Just what resources we are putting into it is is slightly different, and this this spice and slow is very hard for someone to kind of uh, block you or prevent you from doing it. 
like there are multiple spaces that you that only that this player is interested in, like the tech negotiator spot, or let's say drawing. Um, I think everyone likes to draw like at this stage of the game, but you just need kind of like one draw and like maybe tech negotiators or just one draw and a and a decent deck will get you a spice mask flow. And I think that is really the 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 heart the heart of this strategy, right? Being able to to churn out uh, spice mask flows rounds five, six, seven, and um, yeah, I, I I don't think it costs a lot to 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 enable this as, this as well. So maybe it's my perspective from having played against people like Pidge. Um, Pidge is a very important yeah. for doing the Spice Monster Road strategy in the uh, first tournament around. And um, for me, I feel that that type of solitaire play is highly predictable in the sense that there's only a couple of key spots they're going for. Uh, usually they're going for selective breeding or uh, Mentat or tech negotiation to finish off that last bit. Um... I think it's kind of Mimi just because uh, there were various circumstances where people were telling me, you know, it's, it's a strategy that can't really be stopped. And I, multiple times, I'm like, okay, let's see if, if I felt like stopping you, if I could stop it, it was very stoppable. Those three locations, highly predictable. You can get in front of it. You can really mess up someone's turn just by doing that. The only difference is whether or not you want to do it. Um, for me, someone who's more combat oriented I don't like to get in your way it's great that you're not getting in my way in the process of you doing what you're doing so you do your solitaire and I'll, I'll go do my conflict and I find that that strategy um, is completely hinged on the fact that you're basically accelerating one player uh, behind you so if I'm behind you I, I profit big time and it's a great strategy if you're trying to come in second consistently, but you're accelerating the guy right behind you by ignoring all the other spaces. And to me, I think that's a, a, a very a bad look for that strategy just based off of that type of accelerant. That, that's kind of how I feel too, is like if you are, I guess this is sort of a tunnel vision strategy. You You have to just go for those friendships. You don't really care which ones they are. Um, you're picking up whatever you can to draw cards. Obviously, drawing cards is the big, the big kicker here. You need to have like some Bene Gesserit initiates, um, a Piter, you know, uh, the new Piter rather, something that extra that gives you the extra cards for the Spice Miss flows. Spice Miss flows are, I found a bit harder to get in Immortality um, because the better cards that you're actually getting um, from the Immortality or the uh, Tleilaxu deck. They don't have a lot of persuasion, um, and unless you get one of the cards that lets you draw a lot of cards, like the Promo Piter, um, or even the Tleilaxu Infiltrator, then it's it's a little harder to do that. Um, it's still possible, and there's nothing wrong with you can still buy Spice Miss Flows, of course. And I've seen like you know games where people have gotten five, six Spice Miss Flows, so it's obviously not out of the realm of um, reality, but. It's one of those things where usually those players also um, leaned really heavily into spy satellites, um, and those things those things have always been around. Like you, it's always been around since X. Since um, I shouldn't say always, but since X, it's been around that you could, you know, kind of just buy spice must flows and go up and and get free points um, and get the one like alliance. So that saves you a lot of trouble when you get spy satellites, and I think that that works better like maybe there should be we should be talking about like a spy satellite strategy because that is actually a thing that happens a lot and um, i think it's a little bit more frequent than the like the actual hunting fr friendships without it i think that that's a little bit less common um i don't know what do you guys think about that do, are they the same strategy or are they different strategies i think they are they are similar in nature i i don't think you would rush so I, I so first and foremost i think rushing spy satellites is bad i think picking, <laughs> yeah. picking out spy satellites as a, as, a, as a good timing um something when it's not too ex like not too expensive for you i think that is that's good rushing it like immediately depletes all your resources you have no actions you have nothing else in the game you just have some 
points that you could very easily have gotten any, anywhere else. I'm not saying spy satellites is bad, but I think rushing it is bad. So mm. with, with regards to the strategy of like buying spice plus flows, I think in my own playstyle, like it, it, it has evolved a lot into this because there are so many situations where I cannot get into seller shipping access. Like there's just no reasonable way for me to to get access and actually be in position to go to into seller shipping, right? And and because there is because I don't get the troops from there. I don't get the salary from there. You know, I do need to find some other way to get points. And um, turns out drawing cards and just buying Spice Plus Flows is decent compensation. And it is it's one of the ways that I end up um, like being able to compete with the person who have internet shipping access. Which is why I think a lot of my early games in late positions involve, involve like uh, Ilban just because it's so easy to do it on Ilban. You just draw Spice Must Flow so easily because you have one more space that, that kind of unlocks it for you. Um, I, so, I still, so I don't think it's a meme strategy. I, I think it, it is legit. Like it is, it, you, you don't really give up everything else. Like You still are looking at all the other spaces and still weighing in combats. You still want to like put one troop in or go in into one big combat. But you are constantly thinking about... Nine persuasion, nine persuasion. How am I getting to nine persuasion? Then everything else is kind of falls in after that. Now, would you say that a lot of the strategies we're develop, we're talking about here now, they're not exclusive strategies, right? Like these things are kind of like mixed of tactics and strategies. So, like you can do the four friendships, like spice must flows, cheap alliance strategy, and also do a one big combat strategy, right? Like that can fil- that can filter into what you're doing based on the table and opportunity and all that stuff, right? Yeah, it all depends on what, I mean, what intrigues you draw, right? So what, whatever intrigues you draw, it's like intrigues are sometimes like mini quests that you have to go on, right? So yeah. like, if you fulfill these conditions, you get these points, right? And and even if it's like combat cards, like they are also quests that you kind of have to embark on. You just have to find the right moment to play these cards and they con- they they turn, these combat cards turn into points. So you just need to, to recognize what intrigues um, to turn into what kind of like what situ- what what intrigues do you have, and what situations must you create for yourself to for these intrigues to turn into points? I will briefly mention there is a very uh, very nice uh, video in the tournament with Cheesable uh, going with that strategy. Uh, he ends up multiple times missing it, and uh, I think it was the one with Knockmare and uh, Blackstone in it, right? Uh, he just kept getting seven persuasion when. He was aiming for oh god him, like multiple times <laughs> it's it it the it nightmare was, yeah it, it, it was like three or four times and he had the intrigues and he blew up his sonic snoopers for it i, I was like oh man like he, he made a meme video out of it uh ironically <laughs> so go check it out but yeah I, I i by and large agree uh a lot with what you're saying uh, but i guess i'm just a little bit skeptical just because it's it's a lot of uh difficulty in doing those things um, mainly because certain squares are reduced in power and all that so for, for example research station is no longer a, an amazing place to get you your spice must flows consistently you gotta you gotta yeah. get more powerful cards uh, persuasion cards and as cj said uh you getting uh, those tlax cards most of them are only gonna have you one persuasion so that adds to the difficulty of that so i'm not saying it's impossible but it it's certainly a lot easier for me, anyway, in Ix to produce Spice Must Flows than it is in uh, Immortality. Can Can I append a little strategy, or maybe it's a tactic? I'm not. I don't know. Onto our discussion about the sort of solid, solitaire strategy, and I, I saw it recently. I was watching a game. I think you were in Lannister. Possibly even Cheesable was in it too. Actually, I think he was. And I think I, maybe it was Link playing. He had um, for humanity and uh yeah. spy satellites and was just bombing the uh bene Gesserit track and then going down and getting points and buying spice must flows and then doing it again and doing it again like is that a kind of like similar strategy or is that something that you know product of the opportunity of the moment um and just like don't let people also 
have spy satellites and for humanity together like you know what do you do there so uh again it comes down to what you're willing to give up to stop the other person um i think this is um also a style of play as well so um for someone who's normally got two actions like yeah i, I can stop you but I, me spending one action to stop you means i only have one action to go into combat so um <clears throat> that that's the major weakness in my build um i i think for other people like sneaker or cheesable they're much more able to step in and, and stop this so um that's one of the major benefits of them going Swordmaster and all that is the, the ability to stop these type of strategies. Um, it, it is difficult to stop, but if you're all kind of taking your turn, like um, let's say if Sneaker does it one round, then Cheeseable does it one round, you can kind of slow the strategy down. Um, I've seen that type of teamwork happen. Um, it, it's, it's sort of like ganging up on the, the, the mainstay leader, and it is possible. Yeah. It is possible. Cheesable, was this the was this the video you posted? Um, the S tier Paul, is that what I'm thinking of? Because I I did watch it. I think I was watching it in with you guys. I think yeah, I think you were watching it live. Uh, I, I, yeah, it's that video, but I don't think he has spy satellites in that game. But he plays uh for humanity very well. Um, so this is just a, a attention on for humanity. So I have been trying to figure out this card for humanity, and what he does is that he gets to the top, um, the top of the bandages that track. And he disincentivizes anyone from putting any more um, influence into Ben and Jezreel. So what, what this enables him, right? It enables him to reveal for humanity at a crucial moment to go down uh, two in the Ben and because no one else is there. And then he gets a point uh, just by revealing for humanity, which also grants two persuasion. So it leads this to this one big swing turn. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I... I... I also think that that I used to think that that card was bad. Um, I think, and after I saw that game, I was like, okay, there's definitely a way to play it so that, as you said, you disincentivize people from doing the thing they normally want to do, so they go fight elsewhere. And when they fight elsewhere, well, I mean, you don't have to worry about them, so they get in each other's way. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's interesting. It's a cool strategy. All right, who's who's next? Let's do uh, let's do one more. We're we're running a little long. But uh, let's do one more strategy, and then um, and let's call it. Okay. Um, I'll, let, me, let me talk about a strategy that I think is very prevalent in the Rise of X, and I think in Immortality, it, has, it is a very meme or meta discussion. So there are a lot of cards that are good in the Imperium rule. Let's say Gurney, or Talexu Master, or Lady Jessica. So a lot of times in Rise of X, you see these cards in the rule. Round one, round two, you... you plan for your hand to have that amount of persuasion so that you buy it off the row, right? So you go to Tech Negotiator or you go to Research Station or you go like this this strange um, combination of actions that do not involve smuggling or full space, right? And then you to, to buy these cards. Is this now meme or is this now meta? Meme, for sure. Meme, yeah, it's a meme. Yeah, because uh, that might not even be there for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, if CJ sees I go to tech negotiation, turn one, hell no, I'm bombing that row, right? So. Yep, yep. Atomics goes off. You're like, well, that was fun. Yep. Now this these cards suck. Yep. It's happened a lot to me. Um, actually, it's strangely enough, so I used to do um, a segment called um, What the Flop on this channel, and it works in Ix and it works in the base game because the row doesn't change, but you can't do it with immortality at all. You can't plan to choose your leader or what your initial build is or what your buy is going to be based on the row anymore. Um, I mean, to some extent you can, if people are cowards and don't blow the row or something like that, but it, it's not, you end up getting like a middling card from the row as opposed to like a Jessica or, um, I don't know, like a, what do you call it? Um, Liet Kynes. Liet Kynes never stays in the row. You see Liet Kynes in the row. And the first thing someone does is blow it up. They're like, I'm not even letting you open reveal for this card. Um, so, yeah, it's Mimi. It it doesn't work anymore. You can't plan your first turn around buying cards in the Imperium row anymore, sadly. Um, you can plan around the Tylaxu row, but that's about it. Agreed. It's uh, too Mimi on that level. It's just highly inconsistent. This is why that research station... Uh, 
dive in is uh, doable with a good Telax card because even if you only get a mid lane card, as the CG said, it works well with the Telax card most of the time. So, yeah, for sure, I, I think it's a meme build. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna add on to this discussion, right? So, what about getting to five persuasion and um, yeah, getting to was... five, five persuasion for that round and and just um, nuking it or waiting for someone else to nuke it. Is that meta or meme? I was literally just going to say the same thing. So I'm so happy that you did. This is, I think this is um, annoying, but it's, I think it's meme -y. I don't think it's very good. I think it is half and half. Only because there's a lot of good power cards at five. If you can get to five persuasion, it's actually pretty decent. Um, Mimi only yeah. in the sense that uh, you're kind of beating off other people uh, and their capabilities, but it's still a legit strategy. Like, um, actually, I, I, the tournament that's coming up, I really hope to, to that that the Talaxu Master shows up and I can just snap reveal five and just kind of showcase that. It's you know, a lot of people are saying stuff like you know, it's it's a uh, uh, it's good, but it's not that great. But there's a lot of opportunities that you can give up and still come back and turn it around uh, by turn seven, just by snap revealing that. And there are a lot of power cards in, in Immortality that are also five. Um, I, I think it's definitely a good strategy. It's just, uh, unfortunately, it's not wholly consistent because of the bombing, and that's the, the meme part of it. But if you get one of the five cards, it, it's actually pretty decent. On, on the flip side, is open revealing for Tylaxa Master Mimi, or is it meta? I think it's meta. Yeah, I, I think it's Mimi. <laughs> you do? Really? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, uh, to be fair, it does lose at times, but just because a good card loses, it doesn't mean it's, it's like, not, like, strong. Like, my win rate is uh, normally around hovering the 50% a win rate and with that card on the snap reveal i'm roughly 70 percent. so for me it, it speaks volume that's a, that's significant yeah, yeah. It's, it's highly significant and mm -hmm. a lot of the times i'm getting the losses mainly because people are stepping in front of me and i'm like well i lost the whole round buddy like what why are you reacting to this it's because they fear that <laughs> they're going to lose to that card and they overreact and and do other things to step in between and so, you know, even if I've given up a full round and you do that and, uh, you know, does that really count as a loss for the card when, you know, people are overreacting to you? I don't think so. <laughs> it's very powerful, especially if you get it round one, because you're revealing it like three, four, five, maybe times five if you're lucky, but it draws into itself eventually. And it's not that hard to ba the bomb the research track anyway with it. I mean, that's what it does. Um. So yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to, I'm interested to see with the tournament when this comes up, what happens with the person who buys it and whether there's any kind of reaction from the community where people say like, okay, I think we've had enough of this card or maybe everyone's like totally fine with it. And I think it's going to be an interesting, um, an interesting, uh, experiment to see. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's, a. Uh, snap reveal for me i would always snap reveal it if i i've i've not snapped revealed it in a while most people get it before me and uh just turn order you know but i think it's i think it's i think it's meta sadly <laughs> <laughs> i hate it i hate it so much <laughs> me too. all right guys well that's gonna do it for us we have uh covered a lot and you know let us know below if you know any other strategies that uh you play or that you we, you didn't hear us cover that you'd like us to cover or that you want to just you know bring to our attention and uh, tell us whether it is meme or meta and uh why and um uh, that will do it for us thank you to cheesable for for being here today it's great to talk to you great to have lannister of course and uh yeah thank you all for listening we'll see you next time now you guys can say goodbye or something like that <laughs> yeah goodbye mm. goodbye Please try out the okay, Sonic perfect. Super Strat. Please try it out. It's fun. <laughs>